Okay, this is part two of my video on uh, my experience in DEA. The first part I spoke about the academy and how I was hired and that process. And now I'm going to talk about my first few years in DEA, specifically my assignment to DEA Miami. Uh, there's probably uh, a lot of beliefs about what DEA agents did in Miami in the mid 80s, late 80s, and a lot of that is probably informed by TV and, uh, and by accounts uh, written by agents. So there's the popular media, you know, Scarface and Miami Vice and things like that. And then there's, you know, the reality of what our jobs were really like. And again, uh, as I'm saying this, I'm just going to talk in generalities of what, what our jobs were like. Uh, again, it was 35 years ago that I started in DEA Miami, so things are a lot different now. Uh, they're different throughout the agency completely. But as I said in the last video, I graduated the DEA Academy on January 31st, 1986. And I returned to Chicago, which is where I had been hired. And I was there for two months until I had to report to Miami. And during that time, I was assigned to the Chicago Police Drug Enforcement Task Force. I was the only federal agent on that task force. And uh, that was a good place for me, actually, because uh, what the police did on the task force was exactly what I wanted to be doing. They did small-scale buys, arrests, raids. In other words, what a, a young man who's 26 years old hopefully would want to do. Uh, given the choice, would you rather do that? Would you rather be in a money laundering group or a white collar uh, crime pursuing group? Of course, you would rather be doing enforcement work. Uh, now, I was the only federal agent in the group. And because I had gone to Quantico, a lot of the cops, um, they didn't like the FBI for whatever reason. And they said, well, you're related to the FBI. and. Uh, but, but they were all great guys, actually. I think it was mostly just joking. What I did is I, I would pull all the federal paperwork. Most of their cases would go to Cook County uh, Circuit Court, Cook County Criminal Court at 26th in California. But I'd pull uh, the federal paperwork and write up the summary reports or the DEA 202s, basically the DEA paperwork that was required. And uh, got a lot of experience. Um, how things have changed, you know, in those days when you finish the academy, you just went right to work. Nowadays, an agent finishes the academy, they don't do anything for the first 60 days, then they go to their first duty station and then they're assigned a field training agent, who is a senior agent, a GS-13, who's assigned by the group supervisor who uh, kind of leads the agent around by the hand for the first several months of his or her career. I reported to Miami on April 7th, 1986, which was my wife's birthday. And uh, again, this is in the days before cell phones or, you know, I don't think we even had a phone in our apartment yet. We had just moved to Miami the week before. Uh, so I report in and um, I remember sitting at the McDonald's near uh, 53rd Street in Miami, just waiting to report in. I was very nervous that day because it was want to make a good impression. You know, I'm just starting off. And uh, I came in and, and met the, the group supervisor. His name was Pat Shea. God rest his soul. Great guy. And uh, in those days, everybody in the group was in a big, huge squad room. Nowadays, they have little cubicles where all the agents have their own cubicles. But in those days, it was just a big squad room. The only one who had a little bit of a private office was the, the group supervisor. But I was told on that first day, you know, we're going out on a raid this evening, and it's actually a, a case that had developed from out of town. And the agents had come to Miami. They were at the U.S. Attorney's Office preparing search warrants. And uh, there were going to be several residences that we hit as soon as the warrants were signed by the magistrates that evening. So this was something really cool. You know, I'm finally in Miami, and because uh, I didn't know my way around the city, I rode with the, the backup. And before I went out, they said, well, one of these houses, the guy has a cougar, um, a, a, not a car cougar, a, a cougar cougar running around the house. And um, it probably hasn't eaten for a while because we think he's probably gone, but he didn't take the animal with him. So why don't you take an M16, and um, which, you know, that was a good idea because, you know, instead of shooting him with your 38 Special, um, you know, you, you can take out the cougar when we go into the house. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe I, I don't, didn't know what I was getting myself into while we're sitting there waiting to do this raid. 
So we're at Southwest whatever street in Miami, and we're sitting on his house, and finally the word comes, now you guys are on the wrong address. It's Southeast whatever. We almost hit the wrong house, you know, my first day in Miami. So we lift and shift, we go to the other house, and we go in there, and I'm hiding behind the furniture with the M16, like something on, you know, Wild Kingdom, you know? I figure if this thing guts me, eats me alive, you know, maybe someone will get a film of it and they'll, they'll be able to show it uh, forever, you know? It'd be, all, only thing we'll be missing will be Marlon Perkins. But the cougar was nowhere to be found. Um, the search warrant was served. Again, the crook was out of town. I finally got home like three or four in the morning. I hadn't been able to call my wife. She was upset because it was her birthday. And secondly, she was just worried, you know? And this was a very good introduction as to what my life would be like in Miami for the next uh, seven years. You know, I spent seven years in Miami. I went from a grade seven to a grade 13 while I was in Miami. And uh, I was in a regular enforcement group. There were really two types of groups you could be sent to in Miami. Really three types, but the first type was a, a task force group. And the task force was different than any other task force in that it was a customs DEA INS task force. And it was headed, at least nominally, by Vice President George H.W. Bush. And their role was to work with customs at the Port of Miami and containerized cargo would come in, frequently carrying large amounts of cocaine. And the inspectors would drill these trailers and if they found the drugs, the trailer would be moved aside the trailer would be kept under surveillance till somebody came to pick it up and then we would follow it or the agents would follow it to that location and then serve a warrant or make the arrest as they were cutting into the uh, trailer containing the cocaine. Now the group I was in was a regular enforcement group. It was called a response group which meant that we had all of the East Coast so whenever let's say it was New York, Washington DC, Baltimore, any of these cities if they had a investigation that tied to Miami, and many of them did, because Miami at the time is the primary source city for drugs coming in to at least the eastern United States, the agent would then respond, would come down to Miami, and we would work with them to try to locate their source and do whatever investigative work, assist them with that, or whatever investigative work was needed to help them in their investigation. And oddly enough, you know, um, for whatever reason, toward the winter months, there was a lot more need for our help than during the summer months. Um, June and July are very, very hot in Miami. August is brutal, but December is wonderful. So you'd have a lot of agents coming down from New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia and everywhere else in December. But again, it was a great place to be. I mean, of all the places to be, where would you rather be? And right before I had, uh, right after I reported out of uh, headquarters or out of um, the academy, I had received a call from Group 8, which was the money laundering group, and they were going to assign me to that group. And the group supervisor said, you don't sound very enthused. And then I said, well, you know, it's not that I'm very not enthused. I, I'm enthused. I want to be in, you know, involved in any way where I can be of service. But I said, you know, I, I just got married. And, they, oh, you just got married. That's a big, big change. We're going to put you into a house, a big house that we had... Uh, we need somebody to sit on it, but because you're married, you know, uh, you got to get your own residence. So I'm not going to take you in group eight. So they put me in group five, which was a response group, which is exactly where I wanted to be. I wouldn't have been happy in the money laundering group. I would have been very happy, and I was very happy in group five because it's a response group, a lot of enforcement work, a lot of surveillance, undercover, buy busts, search warrants, arrest warrants. All the stuff that you want to do if you're in your 20s. If you're in your 50s, not so much. But if when you're in your 20s, you want to do this stuff. And if you don't, you're in the wrong occupation completely. Now, uh, coming to Miami, you know, what was it like in the, the mid-1980s? Uh, a couple of things stand out. Number one, very, very long hours. Um, not just Monday through Friday, but often weekends as well. You're always on call. And in addition to the responses, we did a type of investigation that is known as a buy bust. Now, what is a buy bust? Well, 
in other cities you could buy small amounts of drugs and work your way up to try to find out the source of supply. But if you're, you're in Miami, all you could get is you, the, the smallest amount of drugs they would allow us to work was one kilo of cocaine. Now a kilo of cocaine at the time would run about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars in Miami. Obviously the DEA does not have money to buy kilos of cocaine. No agency had that much money. You'd think we did, but, but we don't. And usually we would order up like 10 kilos, 15 kilos, and they would bring out one or two and we'd see it and we'd lock the people up and get whoever we could and try to flip them, which is you'd put, uh, after, after reading them their rights, try to get them to induce them to cooperate so that we could find the source. But a lot of times uh, the folks who we arrested were from Colombia and they had family in Colombia and they simply would not cooperate which was fine as well, we would just process them into the jail. And um, the amount of paperwork, you know, that we had to do was enormous compared to state and local police. But it got to a point where within a day or two, you know, we could complete an entire case and we wouldn't even pull a case file until we got the drugs because roughly half of the time we would go out, we wouldn't get anything. So when I got to Miami, uh, I had listened to several agents in Chicago and they said find somebody that's squared away. An older agent who does a lot of cases who squared away who will help you out. Uh, and that was really good advice. And the more senior agent, he wasn't much older, he, was a, he had a couple of years on me, he was a GS-11, I was a GS-7. Uh, so we worked together and I would do a lot of the paperwork and he would do the selling. He would go in and talk to the, the supervisor to get the approval to do the case. And again, some of the differences between DEA then, drug enforcement then, drug enforcement now. Uh, drug enforcement then, it was largely limited again to these buy bust operations. We couldn't do wiretaps because the crooks uh, had a system. They had beepers and pay phones. So how the heck are you gonna do a wiretap? You really can't. Or at least, if you could, I didn't know how to do it. Nobody in Miami knew how to do it. The second thing was the, the amount of undercover work that was done. Everybody got a chance to do undercover. Uh, even, you know, I didn't speak any Spanish. I did undercover, okay? And I would go with the informer who spoke Spanish. It's kind of a dangerous situation, you know. You, the informer's translating for you, and I'm supposed to be from Canada or some BS like that. And you know you don't know what they're blah, 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 back and back and forth in Spanish, and then they're telling you something else. But it's stupid crooks. I thought, always thought you know I look like a cop. No one would ever, you know, want to sell dope to me or take me for a crook. No, they more than happy to. Uh, I never had anyone that, that talked walked away and refused. You know, um, so that was something that was different. Now, if you spoke Spanish, then you were really at a premium. You did a lot of undercover. The agents who spoke Spanish were undercover all the time. Uh, those of us who did not, you know, just in our cases. Uh, but you're always on standby because somebody in the group would have a case going potentially just about every day of the week. And maybe you would have a case going maybe every week, every other week. Okay. And when you're not doing that, you're doing your paperwork. So you would come in the morning, let's say we didn't have an enforcement operation in the morning. You get in the, into the office around 9, 9.30 in the morning, and you, you do your paperwork, and it would be written out by hand and given to one of the two ladies who worked in the office, typing up all of our paperwork. Okay, this is in the days before computers and uh, the internet and everything else. So you didn't have forms on the computer. You would write it out by hand, your DEA reports, give it to them, and they would, would do the paperwork. We'd usually go to lunch and then we'd be on standby, and usually around two or three o'clock, uh, whoever's case is going that night, and sometimes you had a couple of cases going, uh, they'd be meeting with their informants. And these things went, went relatively quickly. They were uh, much more by the seat of the pants, um, and to be quite honest with you, a lot more dangerous than what we did years later. Okay, we would go running out there with very little knowledge sometimes of who we were dealing with. Sometimes the person was just identified. In some cases, they really even weren't that well identified. Um, but again, uh, this was the 1980s. It was a different ball game than what you have right now. 
So you'd go out there, and um, if you were on surveillance, you would set up, and you'd, the undercover would come in with the informer and meet with the crook, and the undercover would break away and say they're going to go get the drugs. Of course, they never have the drugs when they're supposed to have them. So you, you try to follow them. You'd have one team that would keep on the the residence or the location where the buy was being done, whether it was a business, a storefront, a botanica, a house. And then the other people would, would follow somebody who was trying to go get drugs. And more than half of the time, they'd come back and say, the guy can't get the drugs, okay? Uh, and that would last till late at night, and you'd go home and come back the next day and start over again. Uh, while this, these people went shopping for, for drugs, okay? Until they finally found someone with a kilo who would front it to them. And then they'd show it to us and they'd get arrested. And the choice was either you tell us where you got those drugs or you just buy the whole farm and you, you, you go to jail for the whole thing because there's a minimum mandatory, you know? So either you tell us or, you know, you go to jail. One big misconception about the drug world. Um, when I was growing up in high school, you know, I obviously had nothing to do with drugs, didn't hang out with kids that use drugs, but the ones that did, oh man, if you narc, you're in trouble, man, that's BS. Okay, drug dealers, unless they have family members in foreign countries, are more than eager to talk. Okay, drug people are natural snitches, okay? Um, and one thing you quickly find, and I quickly found in Miami, is that you have to sign up informants. Your success as an agent is really dependent on your ability to sign up informants and to keep informants. Uh, there's an art to signing them up. There's an art to getting information from them. There's an art to keeping them under control. There's an art to keeping them content, okay? And you have to do all of those things. If you're not good at it and informants, you're not going to have any cases. And the majority of agents don't produce cases. Okay, and I'll say that again. The majority of agents then, and when I, years later, when I was a supervisor, um, your cases are done. The vast majority of your cases are done by a minority of agents. Uh, you have agents who work hard. You have agents that are more. They help out. They work hard, but they don't produce the cases. Um, now, the cases that I produced, they were, by DEA standards, not the huge career board type cases. You know, I was not behind the indictment of Manuel Noriega or anybody like that. What we did was stats cases, statistic cases. The bosses wanted a lot of arrests. They wanted a lot of drugs on the table. Uh, quantity. You know, not necessarily quality, because just about everyone you're locking up, um, I mean, there are at least dealers in kilo levels of cocaine. So as the scheme of things goes in the United States, they were fairly big. Now, in Miami, there was just a lot more of them. There's a lot more in the, a lot more fish in the sea. And as the old saying goes, if you can't make a case in Miami, you're, you're pretty bad off, okay? So on a usual day then, let's say you know, we had a case that was going, my partner and I would run the case and probably we'd put the, the gravis on the people, nine, 10 at night, you'd process them into the jail. The next morning you would have to get up and go to the United States Attorney's Office, file the criminal complaint. You'd be with them during their initial appearance in court. Then you'd go back to DEA and when you're not working, what you do is you'd write the case reports, process all the evidence, bring the drugs to court. Within three or four days, you should have that case file pretty much completed. Everything is done that needed to be done so that you could move on and do more cases. And that was just the way it worked. Uh, I came to work a lot with the U.S. attorneys. I figured at one point I sat through about 40 criminal trials between 1986 and 1993, which was the years I was in Miami. So I second chaired with the AUSA quite a few cases. And um, you know, it was just something that uh, I was comfortable doing. A lot of the agents weren't comfortable going to the US Attorney's Office. They didn't like the AUSAs. I had no problem with them at all. So um, I think you know, the years in Miami, um, again, the length of time that you worked, very stressful on that, very stressful on your marriage. Uh, if you're a single person, it's great. If you're married, it's going to be very, very hard. It was very, very hard. Um, 
and a lot of the agents' marriages failed because of that. And I would say that the fact that my wife and I were practicing Catholics, that was one of the reasons that our marriage stayed together. Because if, it, if we were not, uh, we would have just, the demands of the job were so great, you know, and the hours that were demanded were, were so heavy that you just had very little time for, um, to spend at home very little time. In fact, on certain days, I had to take days off to have a day off. And that sounds kind of ridiculous, you know, but, but that's just the way it was. There was just so much drugs coming in through Miami that uh, we really had no other choice. Um, later in my time in Miami, an agent I had gone to the academy with went to Pakistan. And he called up and he had a, a pretty good idea. And he said that um, you know, he had been working in Pakistan and they had found a way to smuggle the Pakistanis and the Afghans. This was during the time that the Soviet Union was in Afghanistan. They were still, had invaded Afghanistan and the Mujahideen were fighting the, the Soviets and their Afghan allies, communists. And um, of course that fight was, I think, funded quite a bit by Southwest Asian heroin. But be that as it may, the agent who was assigned to Pakistan told me, you know, the heroin, uh, the drugs, the dogs in the Miami airport are not trained to sniff out heroin. They'll react to cocaine, they'll react to marijuana, but if a person brings in heroin in a suitcase and the sides of a suitcase, the dogs don't alert and these people know it, so they're using Miami as a port of entry. So we came up with a beautiful plan, and that is, in an an informant, a Pakistani, would receive a quantity of heroin in Pakistan. We would go to Pakistan, bring the informant and the heroin back to Miami, and put the, the informant into a uh, apartment that we had paid for, and then he would call back to Pakistan and say, I got through the airport. I made it. I'm here with the drugs. What do you want me to do with them? Because the informant's role was simply to smuggle the heroin and all the, the, the deliverer cared about in Pakistan. He had a customer in the U.S. He needed some way to get the heroin from Pakistan to the U.S. Now, unbeknownst to him, of course, we were the, the delivery people. So he'd call and say, you know, the grass is green or some baloney in the Urdu language. And within a few days, you'd get a call from New York, usually. Or sometimes it was Detroit. Uh, sometimes it was Boston. It was different cities. It was another Pakistani saying, you know, bring it up here. So, no, 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 we're not bringing up anything anywhere. You got to come here and pay us our delivery fee. One. Okay, so then someone would show up and he'd pay the fee, we'd arrest him, and then immediately elicit his cooperation and then make a controlled delivery. And we did this numerous times. We ended up arresting Italian organized crime guys. We ended up arresting Albanian organized crime guys, which you know I never heard that they were an organized crime syndicate, but they are. Black American organized crime groups. This was like the goose that laid the golden egg, and it went on for quite a while. Eventually, we had to bring the informant into the United States. He was one of the few informants that I had respect for, and actually we ended up sponsoring him for permanent residency in the U.S. because his life would not be worth much in Pakistan. Uh, getting back to our bread and butter in Miami, it was informants. You know, if you were good at recruiting informants, you were going to be a productive agent. If you're not good at recruiting informants, you're not going to be a productive agent. And again, uh, there's two categories of informants. There's those you can buy. That is, they work for a fee. And usually they would get a portion if there was assets seized. Okay. They could put in for a portion of the seized assets, or we could put them in for it, and they would get that. And then there were those who were defendants. We had a case over them, and they were facing minimum mandatory, so they would cooperate and work off a of beef, is what we call that, which means that they would get, they would do a number of cases for us, and then we would go to bat for them at court and get them probation or a reduced sentence in exchange for their cooperation. So these years in Miami, you know, from 1986 to 1993, they were the most fun years of my life in terms of law enforcement. Uh, I wouldn't trade them for anything. Everyone I worked with down there, some of them are alive, some of them have passed on, some of them 
went to great things in DEA. Some of them got fired, you know. Um, but, you know, be that as it may, they're all my brothers and sisters. You know, I love them all. Uh, I'm not going to run anybody down. I'm not going to puff myself up because, you know, that's one thing I don't like about DEA agents is we tend to, I think, sometimes uh, harp about how great we're, we are. And, you know, we'll, really it depends on everybody's efforts. Uh, and our efforts really are not successful. Okay, if you know anything about the drug situation in the United States, you know, our, our efforts have never been successful. We're really just catching a small percentage of those who come into the country. Um, what did I think about the drug war then? What do I think about it now? I, I basically have the same opinions of it. I think those who traffic in heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine are involved in really nasty business and that it's a moral obligation of our society to stop drug trafficking. So I'm not going to be one of these former agents that goes in and says, you know, I'm against prohibition or something like that. I'm not. Okay, people who traffic in this stuff deserve the most severe sentences. And I think that's where our, maybe our current president and, and certainly on both sides, you know, they want to let people off right now, the wrong thing to do. I think this mass incarceration that we did in the 1980s, it, was, it had a direct result to that, and that result was a reduction in crime in the 90s and the 2000s. People forget. They forget what the cities were like in the 1970s. Uh, they were crime-ridden dumps, you know, New York City, Chicago, Washington, D.C. You couldn't really go into these areas, but because a lot of the criminal population was incarcerated, you know, the cities, voila, they became less dangerous, you know, but now if we're going to let people out, you're just going to see a repeat because criminals don't become honest, generally speaking. Most of them just stay with crime because it's an easy occupation. It's what they know. One thing I will say is that working in DEA in the 1980s was much more dangerous than it is today. And the reason it was much more dangerous is we relied a lot more on undercover. Our operations were not anywhere near as well planned. And the approval levels that were required, I required by the time I retired DEA, were much, much higher than they were in the 1980s. Okay? In the 1980s, it was a more, uh, you took a flash roll out, and sometimes you passed that flash roll to another group that was out on the street with you. And you'd flash money at night, you'd flash money at different locations, and that, you know, that was put to an end uh, for a variety of reasons, most likely. Most most, read, most readily uh, thought of the desire to keep ripoffs down, robberies down, uh, because that's where robberies tended to take place well, whenever we would flash money. Um, so the job became much safer, uh, but it also became less exciting. I was a supervisor in the field from 2001 to 2008. I was an enforcement group supervisor. And one thing that had changed, not one agent in any of the, either of the two groups that I worked did any undercover. So that was a huge difference between the 1980s and 20 years later. You know, the agency had changed. The agency was much more heavily reliant on wiretaps 20 years later than it was 20 years before. Before that, it was by bust, run from one thing to another. Uh, the third thing was... Uh, the willingness of the agents. I'm not saying that um, the agents today are actually they're, they're better qualified, they're better trained than we were, but they have a, a different work-life balance. Let's put it that way. Um, you wouldn't find people, I didn't find people in my groups when I was a supervisor who wanted to work seven days a week. I was a supervisor of a MET team, which is a mobile enforcement group team from 2001 to 2003 in Washington. I had guys, literally men, come to me in tears saying they need to get off the group because we would be out of town Monday through Friday and their wives were going to leave them. Now, when I was in Miami, uh, if you had a setup like that, guys would have given their right arm to be on it. Okay, it was just a different culture. It was a different time, uh, whether they were married or not. You know, you just wanted to be out there working all times. 
the newer agents, they just came from a different group of people, you know, much less likely to have been in the military. I think mostly just out of college and uh, much safer. And uh, the old days, they'd rip you up and down, swear at you, but no, no paperwork, you know. You just get yelled at if you screwed up. And that was the end of it. The new days, you know, it's write-ups and you got to be sensitive to everybody's feelings. But again, then they would take you formally on charges or discipline much more readily than they would in the old days, okay? The old days, much more dangerous. The new days, you know, uh, or more recent days, the days when I was a supervisor, much, much more micromanagement from the GS-15s, from the SESs, who, many of whom don't do a lot of enforcement work, okay? <laughs> That's not why they became GS-15s and SESs, because they love doing enforcement work, okay? but they don't want anything bad happening on their watch and uh, so if something doesn't get done it just doesn't get done in the old days you'd, you'd go out a hundred times you'd maybe get 30 30 of them would work out and you know maybe five of them would be really good arrests in the new days you know you might work on just one thing for for months on end a wiretap and it may or may not work out um, so again, the culture of the agency changed greatly in 15 to 20 years that I was in there. But the years that I was in Miami, uh, were they glamorous years? No. Were they exciting years? Yeah. Were they dangerous years? Yeah. Did I almost get killed a couple times? Yeah. It almost happened a couple times. Did we do things that we would I would never have approved of doing as a supervisor? Yeah. But again, uh, it's, it's a time that's passed, you know. Miami's no longer the huge source city. It switched, of course, to the southwest border. But it was an experience that I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. So um, uh, again, uh, I was a, an agent in Miami from 86 to, to 90, 93. And it was, uh, I got more experience and had more fun and uh, really, you know, got everything out of my system uh, in terms of drug law enforcement during that time frame, okay? Thanks for listening.